discretion, used nine times in nine verses of the Bible, the act of sound and right judgment before God and men. When God is not a priority, our personal and national economies go flat and disastrous. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hember. And I'm Janice. This is Quick Study, and we are going through the Bible in one year, which means that on this day, we focus on the great prophet Haggai, chapters 1 through 2, where we are talking about the priorities of truth, which don't seem to be very important these days. And uh, why that relates to the economy, we'll find out coming up from the Word of God, the prophet Haggai, stay there. It's going to be very interesting as we wrestle this one to the ground. And we also have Corey here with Bible Archaeology and History. Corey? Today we are going to be exploring some of the lives of some of the Persian kings mentioned in the Bible. Very good. Janice, I want to say hello to everybody at Summerside, Prince Edward Island, mm. uh, listening on 92.5 on the Faithway Network. That's Summerside, Prince Edward Island, Christian Radio 92.5. Great to have you with us. What is Do You Know? Mm -hmm. Beautiful east coast of Canada. I love PEI. Do you know what the life-bearing plants are mentioned after the question is asked, is the seed still in the barn? This is from our <laughs> reading of Haggai 1 and 2. This sounds like a complicated metaphor. Hmm. Is it a metaphor? Is it a simile? Is it both or all three? All three? I only said two. That and more coming up. Stay there. But here's first, Corey with Bible Archaeology and History. According to the very first words of the book of Haggai, the prophet Haggai was writing during the reign of King Darius of Persia. But as you read through the Bible, the Old Testament, there are quite a few kings of Persia mentioned. So right now, you and I are going to try to sort out this list of Persian kings. The time period of Persian dominance in the Bible ranges from King Cyrus the Great, who united the Persian Empire and conquered Babylon, to Artaxerxes I, four kings later during the lives of biblical figures Ezra and Nehemiah. The Bible's history covers these five Persian kings from the point of view of the exiles. Cyrus the Great was prophesied by Isaiah and Jeremiah as a rescuer of the people of God, which ancient records and findings in archaeology have upheld as truth. Cyrus pushed the Persian Empire to the borders of Greece in the northwest to the Indus River in the east. He instituted the first documented system of governing that allowed freedom and support of the religions of conquered people. There were benefits to living under the rule of this new king, yet very swift punishments for the smallest act of rebellion. The next king of Persia was Cambyses II, Cyrus's son. He is not mentioned in the Bible and only ruled for eight years before his sudden death. His main course of action was to spread the empire by conquering Egypt. Cambyses' replacement as king was a member of the royal family, Darius. Darius reigned for 36 years and one of his decrees is recorded in the Bible. Noteworthy in his reign are his reorganization of the empire into provinces, his inventive monetary system, building projects, and his specialization of the Persian army. Darius then began the famous Greek-Persian Wars. 
Xerxes I, seen in the biblical book of Esther, inherited the throne from his father Darius and ruled for 21 years. He continued the attempt to conquer Greece, but he too ultimately failed. The final king of Persia mentioned in the Bible is Xerxes' son, Artaxerxes I. During his 40-year reign, Ezra and Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple and the walls. It is time to explore the wise guys of the Bible today, Haggai 1 to 2. Now, the wise guy of the Bible, Haggai, was a prophet of the returning exile. He ministered from about 559 to 530 BC. His name means festal. It probably indicates that he was born during one of the feasts of ancient Israel. Haggai is wise. He challenges the leadership of his day not to become preoccupied with their own success or comfort, but he burns upon them the priority of putting God's house first. It was God who was the center of the community and God who would build their futures, not their own ideas or their personal successes. This is a very wise truth even for today. Haggai 1, 1 through 15. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm, and he who earns wages earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little, and when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the twenty-fourth day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Haggai chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. My name is Rod Hembry. You're watching Quick Study, listening to Quick Study Radio. Thank you for staying with us. And today we are exploring this amazing prophet Haggai. Now this guy is amazing for lots of reasons. But one of the reasons I like him is he challenges our priorities. Now let me ask you a question. 
What is it in your life that takes your time, that takes your money, that draws on your emotional resources? Something that you love to do so much that you willingly give your money and your emotional resources and your time to it. Whatever that is, that's a priority in your life. And today Haggai comes to us across time and space after 2,500 years and reminds us of priorities. Very, very important. Let's take a look at Haggai chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. The Bible says, in the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehoiadak, the high priest. Verse 2, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the prophet said, this people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Verse 3 says, But then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell into your paneled houses and this temple to simply lie in the face of all nations in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Haggai is amazing. He says, to the people who say, well, no, it's not time yet. The, the time's not right. You know, we've, we got together and we had a committee. And, and the committee decided, well, we can't really afford to do that right now. So we're just going to enjoy and stay comfortable. We can't mess with our comfort. And the prophet comes along through the power of God's Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit looks them in the eye and he says, hey, consider your ways. What is more important to you, your comfort or the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the house of God? So there's the first point. When God is not a priority, our personal and national economies go flat and they tank. Now let me tell you something. A nation has lost its vision. When a nation dedicates all of its resources to nothing but keeping its citizens comfortable. That's a mistake. God has a call on every single nation in the world. We have over 156 flags hanging in our church. And every nation, every nation has a call of God to accomplish something. Some nations are called to cure cancer. Other nations are called to wipe out world hunger. Still other nations are called to make clean water around the world. Every nation has a call of God upon that nation. It is when the nation begins to look only at itself that it loses the call. That's what happened to God's people in Haggai's time. He comes against them in verse 6 of chapter 1. He says, you have sown much and you bring little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put it into a bag. And it's like the bag has holes. Verse 7, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple of God that I might take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You've looked for much, but indeed come to little. And when you brought it home, it blew away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because my house that is in ruins while every one of you is in his nice house. Verse 10, therefore the heavens above withhold dew and the earth withholds fruit. This is intense. This is amazing. You see, when God is not a priority in our communities, in our families, everyone is in consistent need and want. Our crime increases, our peace decreases. Beloved, did you know that the United States of America and Canada spend five times the amount of money on crime at home than they do on war? That's because our priorities are destroyed. Look at verse 11 of chapter 1. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains and on the grain and the new wine and the oil and whatever the ground brings forth and on men and on livestock and all of the labor of your hands. He's talking to God's people now. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, and Joshua, the son of Jehoiadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, they obeyed the prophet of the Lord, their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord, their God, had sent him. 
And do you know the people began to fear the presence of the Lord? Verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke to the Lord the message of the people saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shittiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehoiadak, the high priest, the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came... And they worked on the house of the Lord their God on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Beloved, here's the point. When God is a priority, revival happens and is with us. God is with us. You see, revival is not a constantly seeking of signs and wonders or trying to change the laws of a land. A revival is when we, as God's people, Make God our Lord first in our lives as a priority. When we repent and we come to him and when we make that priority, we say, God, you know, I am not so interested on my vacation 20 years from now, but I'm interested in the souls of people who don't know you, who walk the streets of New York, who walk the streets of Chicago, who walk the streets of Toronto, who walk the streets of Vancouver. I'm concerned about those souls and I'm going to spend my resources getting the gospel to them then revival comes. The teaching material on today's program is in print form in our Bible guide. Write for yours today. The address is coming up later. Haggai is writing the book called after his own name, the book of Haggai in the Old Testament during the time period of the Persian Empire in the Middle East. But he's writing during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah after the return of the um, Jewish exiles. So right now we're going to take a look at that return. The book of 2 Chronicles and the book of Ezra both contain the edict of Persian King Cyrus releasing the Israelites who had been taken captive during Babylon's destruction of Judah. Jerusalem had lain desolate for 50 years and Babylon's first wave of exiles had been captive for around 70 years. The scripture reminds the reader that their return had been prophesied the century before by the prophet Jeremiah. Yet the return was not full. Israelites willingly remained in the Persian Empire, and those take the starring roles of the books of Esther, Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, Zechariah, probably Malachi, and possibly Joel. These post-Cyrus the Great exiles had two more mass returns to join on to. The first was led by Ezra, three kings after Cyrus the Great. In the ancient records, Ezra is called a scribe skilled in the law of Moses and a man determined in his heart to study the law of the Lord, obey, and teach it. Around 457 BC, Ezra the scribe priest led a detachment of Israelites back to Jerusalem, carrying an abundance of treasure without an official guard. Ezra wanted to behave the way he taught, that God is the protection for his people. And so Ezra declined the royal guard accompaniment offered to him and instead prayed. The last official return to Jerusalem happened 13 years later under the supervision of Nehemiah, the Jewish cupbearer to the Persian king. The goal of this return was to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The first return ordered by Cyrus began the reconstruction of the temple the second return under Ezra completed the temple, and the third return rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Quick Study TV has over a million viewers a week who watch around the world. Thank you for watching. And we hope this daily telecast is meaningful to you and your spiritual walk with God. Every month, Rod Hembry creates a special personal Bible commentary on the scriptures we study. We call it the Quick Study Wise Guide. This exclusive Bible commentary is not available in any store or online except through our website. It is reserved for those who choose to support this ministry in any amount. If this ministry has encouraged or helped you in any way, then we encourage you to pray about supporting us regularly in any amount. 
When you do, the monthly subscription of Quick Study Wise Guide will be sent to you automatically. To join us and support the teaching and the preaching of God's Word in the public spaces and places of our current culture today, send to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. In the United States, you can send to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, you can call at 519-940-8338. In the United States, you can call at 724-733-8336. You can also get a hold of the Bible Guide and support us online at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. This is Quick Study. Hello, Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island in Canada mm -hmm. on 91.3, uh, the radio network of CJLU. So that's 91.3. It is great to have you listening along uh, every day from 5.30 to 6 o'clock. We have 13 new radio stations that are carrying Quick Study right Praise now. God. So that's great. Mm -hmm. So listen, if you're listening on radio, please contact us and let us know. Remember, our website is BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And also, hello to everyone on Hope TV, yes. Canada's brand new Christian superstation, the only Christian station in Canada that is coast to coast on basic cable. It's a unique thing. It's a very fascinating. And so it's great to have you. We're on at 7.30 Winnipeg time, which is 8.30 in Ontario, and of course 6.30 uh, just uh, in Alberta there. And in BC, it's 5.30 in the evening. So it's great to have you with us. Mm -hmm. Now then, let us focus specifically on this do you know question. We're talking okay. about plants. Yes, we are. And we're reading in Haggai chapters 1 and 2. So do you know what life-bearing plants, and I'm looking for four are mentioned after the question is asked, is the seed still in the barn? Looking for four <laughs> life-bearing plants. Okay, we, we've got this, this metaphor situation, a mm -hmm. simile situation, Corey. Can these questions get any more complicated, Corey? They can. Uh, I guess they probably could, <laughs> but I'm having a hard time with this set of questions, I'm going to be honest. I'm not sure, but life-bearing plants, Middle East, I'm going to take a guess. All Go right. for it. Go gonna, for it. We're waiting. Mm -hmm. There's four. I'm going to guess figs, pomegranates, grapes, and dates. That's my guess. Figs, ah, pomegranates, grapes, dates. She's, She's very sharp, close. She's man. She got really three out of four. Let's read it together. Haggai 2, verse 19. Here we go. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, there's your grapes, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree ah. have not yielded fruit. But from this day, I will bless you, says the Lord. So very good. Actually, you got three out of four. Good I job. I love olives. <laughs> I know. Olives are awesome. Olives are, are delicious. Like very good, family. Corey. We got olives. Olive people. Now, Corey, you know what's happening at the end of this month? What is happening? Well, now, a lot of people, they're, they're thinking I'm talking about, you know, the pagan festival of Samhain, which is celebrated as Halloween, but I am not. I'm talking about something far more important, and that is at Phoenix University of Theology, of which I'm the volunteer chancellor, we are graduating 40 students in seminary studies. Uh, we've got, I think, 10 doctorates going, mm -hmm. uh, people who are graduating all over the world, but one of those students graduating with a double master's, mm -hmm is Corey Hembry. I know her. So congratulations, <laughs> Corey Hembry, on your Thank you. Master's in Bible Theology and your Master's in Bible History and Archaeology. Thank wow. you. Thank you very much. You've been I'm working excited. a long time for this. Yes, many years. What, many, seven, eight years, years now you've been working on yep, this? Yep, seven. Seven Very years. good. <laughs> and she is now our, of course, our journal. She's now one of our teachers yes, in the Bible true. Discovery Seminary. That's true. And I also want to say to you today, happy anniversary. Yes. This is yes. our anniversary. And there's something special happening in Corey's life other than her graduation. Happy anniversary. <laughs> 32 years. Mm -hmm. She still likes me. That's the grace of God going on right there. Anyway, uh, what, what are you doing in February, Corey? Well, in February, I'm going to begin an opportunity for me to have an anniversary <laughs> like you guys. I'm getting married in February. I got engaged on my birthday, which is back in May, and I'm the proud owner of an engagement <laughs> ring. My fiance's name is Matlock, and he's amazing. He's lovely. <laughs> Matlock Babechko is an amazing guy, and of course, 
actually long several weeks before mm -hmm. he asked her he came to us yes, personally and said I'd like to ask your daughter's mm -hmm. hand in marriage and I know our family's expanding it's because expanding. our son Ryan is marrying beautiful Jasmine actually yes. by the Who's time right this airs right by here. the time right. this airs they'll already be married I know <laughs> I know and and Jasmine is our vice president of the Bible Discovery mm -hmm. Seminary and Matlock we're working together on some films about Bible stories yes. and uh, it's we're we're working on that for a couple of years down the line, it's going to be very interesting. We want to do shorts and different kinds of things to illustrate mm -hmm. the principles of the Bible. So the Lord is doing amazing things. Thank you for your prayers. Remember, we're supported by viewers just like you. Please pray about supporting us. Unwise individual, family, city, or nation has a priority of self, fulfilling its personal or collective dream and its own desires. You see, when we are all about ourselves, we will never have enough, and we will be miserable. But God's wisdom is at work in us when we make our lives, our families, and communities and nations about God's priority, to save lives, to restore dignity, honor, and respect of humanity and most of all, to honor God first. This is how people, communities, cities, and nations grow and succeed. Anything else leads to destruction. So with that we pray, Lord, teach me not to make my life all about me, but all about you. Thank you for staying with us today on Quick Study. It is time to study the Proverbs. Now today in our Wise Up segment, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11 says this, Even a child is known by his deeds, whether what he does is pure and right. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because there is a kind of moral code, isn't there? Uh, even if people do not believe in God, it's pretty hard for them to say it's okay to murder the innocent. The truth is that there is a conscious in each and every one of us. Romans chapter 1 says, Men are actually without excuse because there is kind of a voice in your head, a quiet voice that God has put there to help you understand there's some things that are right and some things that are wrong. Now your conscience may be bothering you today, maybe not on the surface, maybe on the surface you're the, you're the party guy, you're the comedian, you're the guy that's got it all put together, but underneath you know something is wrong. That's because there is also a God-shaped void inside of you. And only Jesus Christ can fill that void, give you purpose and meaning. Come to Jesus today and pray and say, you know, Lord, I believe you died on the cross and rose again. I devote my life to you and I give you my life today. Thank you for joining us today on Quick Study. We are supported by viewers and listeners like you. Remember, on radio, our address is P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. You can also reach us at BibleDiscoveryTV.com.